So before we begin, I just want to give a shout out to dmaworld.com. They are a, a consulting agency that helps small businesses become large businesses. They don't want you to feel that you have, need to spend tens of thousands of dollars for companies to you know, help you get started, where they give you great advice and they help you along the way. So check out dmaworld.com. They are a great consulting agency who cares about their people and wants to help. So check them out once again. It's dmaworld.com. I'm happy to be here, Stacey. Thank you so much. And, you know, I know your story and how you've overcome obstacles. And I'm really excited about this conversation. I hope it makes a huge difference for your audience. We're going to really get into the nitty gritty of how to be successful, powerful women and men in the face of obstacles and trauma. So, um, yeah, I can get right into a deep conversation or we can keep it light. What do you want to do, Stacey? You know, I love deep conversation. Okay. I, I think deep conversation is great because it helps people really deep, you know, start to really think and start to really look in deep inside their own selves and realize that, you know, change is possible. No matter what you go through in life, no matter what obstacles you endure, there is always room for change. A lot of people, you know, have a hard time overcoming obstacles in their life and either they're, they just don't know how they get stuck they fear the change, you know, there's a lot of different things, you know, or it could go all the way back to the root cause, the environment they grew up in, how people told them that they can't change, how they're no good, how it's not possible, you're never going to amount to anything. You know, there's so many things that, you know, can go on in someone's life. So really, you know, it's, I, I believe it's all in the root, you know, it all starts in the, in the, in the root. So if we really, you know, take a moment to really think about what we've gone through in life, and really think about, you know, how can we overcome it? How can we overcome the trauma in our lives? Because it's possible, you know, anything that you endure in life, you know, I, I believe, you know, any, anything that happened to you that was negative, you could always pull something positive from the negative. And you can okay. look at it, as, totally. you know, to build in strength. You can look at it as, as a way of you, you've endured some experience from it and it's actually helped you make you a better person. And it, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that negative doesn't mean that it's a bad thing when, when traumatic events happen in our lives or we, you know, come across obstacles, it actually could be a good thing because it could take us on a new path or a new journey. And we could really, you know, help us grow in ways that we never thought were possible. So it, it's interesting, you know, at the time of the recording of this podcast, I'm just getting back from um, a month long working vacation uh, where my husband and I traveled cross country to go mountain biking. And, um, you know, when you're on vacation, you try to do new adventures. And so I was doing some trails, some mountain biking trails that were um, black diamonds. And so, you know, in the moment of looking at a physical rock obstacle, I'm mm -hmm. really face to face with who I am as a person. So if we look right. at, who, you know, what's the most recent obstacle or the most, uh, what's your rock of the day? Um, yeah. you know, maybe it's a person at work or maybe it's somebody um, in your life that's giving you a hard time, or maybe you're just caring for somebody um, who's going through a difficult time. One of the, the strengths that I pull from is I love to podcast. I love to listen to other people and their experiences because I believe that stories really make a difference. So the stories yeah. of our lives really are the fabric of our lives. And so I decided, you know, I'm 50, uh, I'm 50, I'm going to be 54. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that I look at is my 30, 34 years as a publicist. I first became a publicist when I was 20 when I was going through theater school in Chicago at DePaul University. And then later I got my master's degree in human development. And as I was going through my studies and as I was going through life, paying for student loans, trying to figure out if I'm gonna be married, I eventually did get married by the way, I've been married for um, more than 20 years. One of the things that I looked at was um, the hardships that I had growing up. And I had a very loving family, but we unfortunately moved next door to a pedophile. So when I was 17, I put that man in jail um, by giving testimony to the police. And, you know, I never really told that story. And while I dealt with my complex PTSD in private with therapy and personal development, and then also my own studies, um, I never really talked about it publicly. Um, right. And in fact, you know, my family requested that I not talk about it. And so it wasn't yes. until the pandemic 
where we had a lot of time to reflect, a lot of time to walk by ourselves, a lot of time to be alone, where I thought, you know what? It's really time that I share these secrets to my success because there's a lot of people out there hurting. And yeah. the one thing that really put it over the edge for me, Stacy, was I received a phone call late at night from uh, a 20 year old woman who had been raped in college. And um, she calls me, you know, Aunt Michelle. And she said, Aunt Michelle, does it get any better? Because I want to end my life tonight, right? Mm -hmm. The pain in her body was so great. She wanted to commit suicide. I mm -hmm. talked her through that night. She's living today and she's successful in a marriage and happy with a home and all this stuff. But the thing that we talk about even to this day is that it takes work, right? It takes the, yes. it takes the courage, just like I had courage in front of that rock and that, you know, fun adventure. It takes courage to tell the truth that I'm scared. I'm hurting. I need help. And right. so these are the things that I think, you know, even though you have a successful podcast, I have a successful PR firm the fabric of our lives that makes the difference is yeah. who we are moment to moment when things happen around us and how are right. we going to respond powerfully? You know, I like the word responsibility and I think about it to myself as ability to respond. And so many of us are reactive today. We're reactive to news cycles. We're reactive to the complaints of our best friend or maybe yeah. we're out at the grocery store and somebody cuts us in line or something. And right. then we're immediate to react rather than having that human bonding moment of, gosh, why is that person treating me so badly? Or why is that person complaining so much? They're hurting. So mm -hmm. how can we actually give space to the stories that give people the ability to communicate what's really real for them. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. You know, I think people, when you're going through pain, I think one of the uh, important point that you made was that, you know, a lot of times we grew up in a society where we were told, you know, to not talk about it. You know, if you, uh, if you went through trauma or if you went through, you know, if, if, if someone, you know, did touch you inappropriately or you went through some type of illness, you know, there is a lot of stigmatism out there. There's a lot of labelism out there. And, you know, people always gave us the notion, I, I don't know about you, but where I came from, you know, don't talk about it. People will look at you differently. They'll think about you differently. You know, you, you, you know, it's, it's not a good thing, you know, keep it quiet to, to yourself. But then as you keep these things quiet and you don't talk about it, you repress these emotions and those remote emotions become, you know, deeper and they become worse and worse and harder for you to handle as an individual. And they could actually, you know, hurt you to the point where you become emotionless because you, you've developed so many repressed emotions. It's like a, a, a pot of bo a boiling water. You know, you can only boil water for so long on a high flame before it runs over. And then once the water runs over, you, you, you kind of lost control and, you know, and that's where I think the, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder comes in is because you had so many repressed emotions that you had and you were told not to talk about it. And, you know, th these are hurting feelings inside that need to be expressed because when you're hurting inside, you know, a lot of times people keep those things personally to themselves because they don't like to share it. But the, the best thing you can do is to talk to somebody because, you know, just by that person talking to you, that you, you know, you help save a life. And that's an accomplishment that is just, you know, uh, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment. It's, 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 you know, I, I remember when I, I had epilepsy. And I still do, and it's controlled. But when I was when I was going through it, I wrote my book, Epilepsy, You're Not Alone. And I I talked about I created a regiment on how to control your your seizures and how to live a healthy and happy lifestyle. And one person had went to Barnes and Nobles and they were on the verge of suicide. And, and they they found my book and they read it. And there was lots of letters of inspiration from hundreds of people that had it and how they overcame it. And then I talked about how I overcame it and how I was able to move forward in my life and not let this disorder get the best of me. And she said that it had saved her life. And 
and she wrote me an email and I just happened to open it. And she said, I just want to say thank you because I was on the verge of suicide and I found your book in Barnes and Nobles and you saved my life. Thank you. And that wow. was when I realized the, the, the power, the wisdom, the power of wisdom of words, or should I say the, you know, how powerful words could be, you know, just by what we say, we can influence someone's life so traumatically. That's why when I, when I talk to people, I always think before I talk, I always try to encourage, I always try to, you know, motivate people because really pe people don't realize, but you could, by, by talking to someone and helping somebody and sharing things, you could actually change someone's life in such a traumatic way. I love that. Congratulations, by the way, that must have been so satisfying for you to get that email from her, right? I mean, that must have been like, you know, because we don't really share our story. We don't really share who we are. We talk about the weather. We talk about politics. We talk about things yeah. you know, that are in the news that may not even really make a difference to our lives, right? Yeah. And so, you know, Let's talk about the questions that when you're having conversations that really make a difference, I would like to know a little more about your regimen. Um, I'm going to just start the conversation by saying, you know, when you're faced with somebody like, you know, you're having coffee with a girlfriend and the girlfriend just starts to complain and you're like, oh, you know, what people label that as, as like an energy vampire or they make it wrong. Well, what about if we shifted that? And we looked at like, they're doing that because they're hurting. Right. What if we actually um, took a, a tenant from nonviolent communication, right? Because I'm a geek about all things human development, right? So I've read all the books and then all the courses and all that stuff. There's something yeah. from nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg's work, um, <laughs> where he encourages us to ask, what do you need? Right. What if we just asked with our loved ones or the people that we meet in the, in the day to day, what do you need? What do you need, Stacey? That's an excellent, you know, I love that. You, you know, you couldn't have said it any better. You know, a lot of times when we look at people and they are complaining about this, they're complaining about that. They're actually, you feel like you're getting the energy sucked out of you because all they're doing is complaining, 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 but we never really stop to think why they complain so much or right. why they talk so neg negatively about everything and why they have to really like, you know, pound on everybody, look for the imperfections in everybody. It's because it's, it's not, it's not them the other people it's the, the people who are speaking they're hurting inside they have pain they have insecurities you know they're the ones with the issues and they're looking for help and we don't realize that you know they don't they're not verbally asking for the help but you could see by their actions and their behaviors that they need help that right. they you know, and uh it's a reflection but, of like the outward behavior is a reflection about what's going on the inside so, you know, what do you need is a question, um, you know, what happened to you that you're acting this way? You know, I volunteer, um, you know, in some local boards and whatnot. And, you know, not everybody who shows up to volunteer um, <laughs> has the same level of communication skills, let's say. Yeah. And um, so one of the things that I always encourage people to question when they're being spoken to badly by another person is um, to, to first give space, give just a pause to, un to ask the question, you know, um, that hurt person is hurting and that's why they're hurting me. Can we like be more of an observer? Like you're looking at a reality show, not your own life, but you're kind of looking at it like, cause we're used to watching reality shows now. So can we have a little bit of distance in what's actually happening and how we're being spoken to so that we can lend a hand? you know, right. and really be human with each other, they would go a long way. And I know that it sounds trite, you know, right? Because we've got lots of real problems going on in the world. There's yeah. war, there's hatred, there's division, um, there's distrust. What if we could emulate what we want to actually have and be in the world? So when I talk about complex PTSD, people often go, oh, Oh, well, she's damaged goods, right? That's what we do with in the Me Too movement. That's what that's what you do with those women and men, right? Yeah. They're damaged goods. It's not true. And I want to tell you that, you know, uh, a lot of people 
the statistics are staggering about how many people are suffering um, and trying to deal with trauma. Right. And trauma comes in all forms. Illness comes in all forms. And one of the things that uh, want to kind of change the understanding of, because people, I remember opening up Stacy at points in my life to express myself. And then I would um, try to share what happened to me, although never very detailed. And then people would say, oh, well, you've got a mental illness. And then I would say, you know, there's a stigma around that. And I'm saying, but I would, but I wouldn't feel like I had a mental illness. I mean, I had friends who were right. bipolar or had OCD. I knew what a true mental illness was. And right. then when I was writing my memoir and I was doing a lot of research, um, the term mental injury um, came up in a book that I read called The Body Keeps the Score. And I thought about the term mental injury and then I started to obsessively look at on the internet. I don't know if you do that. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I have to watch every podcast, I have to watch, read every book. And I do um, that too. Right. And so I was like, mental injury, that is what I have, right? Just like on my mountain biking, I go over that rock, I fall, I scratch my shin. Yes. So what I have a scar and that my shin has like a little dent now <laughs> from when I've done too many whitewater kayaking trips or too many falls on my mountain bike. The, yeah. it, the wound heals and right. just like the trauma it will heal yes and in many ways we either keep it in place or we learn from that injury and it makes us stronger you know yes, it does. and it so does. this is in you know I'm not only an international publicist I've been um, teaching spin classes and group fitness and personal training uh, for about gosh, 12 years now, it's just kind of my happiness hustle on the side. I love it. Yeah. And I, I try to like get people jazzed up about being strong in their bodies. You know, yes. I, we now know uh, that complex PTSD manifests in physical conditions. Mine happens to be third degree scoliosis. Mm -hmm. And so as I age, the exercise and the movement is really important to keep the yes. physical shell strong so that I can continue yes. to kayak and mountain bike and um, you know, compensate for sitting in a chair for so much of my life as a publicist. Right. But then there's the piece of the writing piece for me. The reason why I write at Psychology Today and blog for them is because it fills me, it, it has me kind of um, process what's happening in my life. You know, yeah. the little things like we turn on the news, we see something in the news that's super upsetting. Yeah. I feel triggered, right? Everybody's like, oh, you've triggered me. Well, that's true. And we want to be authentic about that, but we don't want to use that to distance ourselves from others. It's yeah. just a way to really look at ourselves internally. And I like to write. Other people use other, they might um, use art. Um, mm -hmm. They might use performance. You know, there's a lot of ways to express yourself as a human. Um, right. I, I find it so fun because I just got back from Moab, Stacy, and you know, mm -hmm. the petroglyphs, like you're yes. looking at all the, <laughs> so we humans have been expressing ourselves even on rock for a yes. long, long time. <laughs> oh, yes, for sure. For so sure. What, do you, what do you do to soothe yourself? Like what type of, what type of soothing rituals or um, what do you do for yourself? I'm really curious. I, I love to meditate meditation mm. is, is definitely something that has helped me um throughout my life um i you know in the morning especially i'll take a moment you know to just you know find a quiet space and i've actually created a room in my house just for meditation oh and what did you I, include I, in the room like what tell us about the room be specific because yeah. we want to copy it so i did um a lot of uh I combined Asian and African designs in the room and furniture, and I used uh, different colors like gold, like maroon, and uh, very soothing colors. And uh, I, what I did was, is that you know I, I found you know like um, I found different types of bamboo and vases and things that just brought me to a different way of thinking, more like the Eastern Asian and, you know, and then just, just taking me to a different world, an area where I just felt more at peace. I felt more, you know, more like 
the alternative medicine, different way of thinking. It made me feel, you know, another way of living, you know, which is, is, is a way that everyone should try to incorporate into their lives. It was more of a serenity, peaceful setting. And I got chakra bowls. I love, you know, aligning my chakras and I would, I would close my eyes and I would, people don't realize what breathing techniques are so important. Yes. You just slow down your breathing. You could even do this in the car to prevent anxiety or to calm yourself or to put yourself in a better space where you can close one nostril, breathe in slowly in through the nose, out through the mouth. And you could even do it in your own home. And then you just breathe out. And you do this and you do it on the other nostril. Clear your mind and you just focus on the sounds around you, the silent sounds around you. And if you could hear birds chirping outside or just the quietness, light a couple of candles. I have special candles for the chakras that are uh, that are relaxed and some of them have lavender in it. And I would then take out the bowls and dependent on how I'm feeling and where I feel my blockages. Like if I feel emotion, if I feel like there's something, you know, going on with my emotions that day, I'll take out the, the heart chakra bowl and I'll start to do the vibrations and I'll start to focus on the, the sound of the vibrations. And people don't realize how powerful sound therapy is. And when you focus on those sounds, you'll even feel tingling in certain parts. You may feel tingling in your chest in your brain, in the frontal lobe of your, of your brain, you know, or the, or the, uh, you know, right in the uh, temporal lobe, you might feel some tingling going on. And then you just focus on sounds and you keep the breathing going slow and you just start to feel a difference. You really do feel a difference. And as you do that, you start to close your, your mind and you start to think about peaceful things and letting go of the negativity, that black cloud kind of goes away. And then you start to bring in all the positiveness and you start to feel, you know, you start to, you know, you could talk out loud and you can, you know, you know, you know, talk, I say, talk to the universe. Cause I always believe we have the angels are watching over us. Our higher power is whatever we believe in faithful, you know, whatever our faith may be, they are, you know, people are listening, call out just, you know, and they will respond. And I do this practice and sure. then I feel really peaceful afterwards. And I feel, I feel clarity. I feel focused and I feel energetic. And, you know, that was one of the things that I do. And I like to do yoga and I like to exercise like you do. I love yeah. doing you know, physical activity was always something that I always loved to do. And I would, you know, focus on, you know, I will, you know, I eat healthy and I try to do what's right for me. And I, you know, I had created a lifestyle that in limitations in my life that I feel that have benefited me, you know, because everybody is different. So everybody needs a lifestyle that it soothes them. So people have to realize it's not about comparing yourself to the person next to you or trying to be like other people. It's really looking deep into yourself and what do you need in your life? What's going to make you a better person? What's going to strengthen you? And those are the things that you do and you create a healthy routine for yourself and you practice that healthy routine. And then you start to see different changes. And I love keeping a journal and I practice gratitude. I practice kindness. I practice, you know, I write and I, I, you know, sometimes you'll get those thoughts that just race through your head and I write them down and I, and I talk about my emotions and it's, it's, and it's, it's a, a form of therapy that feels good. And then I set short-term goals and I set long-term goals. And if I don't meet all those goals, I don't get upset with myself. I do the best I can. And if I, if I can't do more, then there's always the next day, but I don't mm. beat myself in the head over it. I, you know, a healthy routine. I think that it's sorely missing, right? Like, yeah. you know, um, you know, as I'm listening to you talk, you know, as far as a healthy routine, I'm like reflecting like, that's usually what I put in place for myself, the soothing piece, you know, whether we were taught as children or not, what a healthy routine is. Um, there's lots of podcasts that tell you like you, the, the information we have it right. Healthy routine. It's what you're eating. It's how you're sleeping. It's how you're moving your body and keeping it strong. It's whether yeah. you're actually checking in. Um, I want to talk a little bit. I think it's really interesting about your, um, the chakras, right? So, um, first of all, I was raised in a very religious home, very Christian. 
And then mm -hmm. later in life, um, I was exposed. My great grandmother was uh, Native American. And so mm -hmm. I've really had the gamut. And then I've also experienced 12 step programs and whatnot. So I yeah. think it's really important. I even had one friend who, um, you know, I was actually her sponsor and um, she said, I just can't do the Jesus thing. Like she couldn't, she couldn't come to believe in a higher power. And I said, yeah. can you come to believe in dogs? And yeah. she goes, what? And I said, God, dog, right? And she goes, I don't, I'm not following. And I said, well, doesn't a dog, your dog, because she had a dog. I said, doesn't your dog unconditionally love you? And she says, yeah. And I said, that's all we're talking about when we talk about higher power, God, infinite being, universal love, whatever you want to call it. We're talking about this unconditional love that we have for ourselves, for others, the connection between us. And so that really empowered her. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging anybody out there who's, you know, if the whole conversation about higher power disempowers you, then just think about the, um, the unconditional love that you have experienced in your life. And maybe it's not any more than your pet, right? Yes. <laughs> Petting a pet, a cat or a dog, that's sufficient. You yeah. can feel that, uh, what that feels like inside your system. I want to tell you a story, Stacey about sound vibration because I didn't really experience sound healing until much later into my yeah. late 40s and I think that it's really important what you're talking about and if you haven't really gotten into the chakras like Stacy's talking about you can at least put your hand on your heart and your belly and understand that you have a digestive system and that you have a heart center right and if you want to go deeper than that there's a whole body of work that spans thousands of years yeah one of the things that uh when i i teach at a very religious gym mm -hmm. and they don't allow conversation they don't even allow the word yoga yeah oh okay? wow yeah <laughs> so um but i'm yoga certified so with yoga box, right? <laughs> so i'm like how can I bring in the healing that I know exists, but not, but also be respectful of people's beliefs? Right. Guess what I came up with? And I'm going to share it with you all. It's so awesome. And you, uh, you can borrow it. Okay. Anybody can borrow this. Cause I think it's so awesome. So I was really struggling, right. Cause I'm yeah. like, I really want to bring in, I just gotten back from Hawaii. I had the sound healer. I had the, the whole vibration of the body. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> I want to like bring it to everybody, but I can't talk about it. Right. Again, yeah. stifled, you know, shut down. Okay. But I came up with home. If everybody says home, if you say home, your whole face vibrates, right? If you say heat, and then the heat kind of goes up to here, right? And right. Then you go, yum. If you say yum, it goes down into the body, right? Wow. So if you I just go, that. yeah. And it was winter time. So when we heat the house with fire or home feels yummy <laughs> oh my god I love that isn't it great it's, I know I had kids in the group right and nobody was offended nobody was offended because I wasn't like having them chant or whatever everybody loved it right I'm in the I live in the south and so there's lots of beliefs you know I lived in the bible belt and so it was yes. respectful but if you say yum you're vib you're vibrating and it and it it heals the body because the body you know um attention goes as a uh, attention grows where intention flows yes that's <laughs> it right and yes. so we want to think about that it's the same thing like with muscle building right if you're yes. trying to build a bicep you want to intend and you know work that muscle work that intention on that muscle yes with the vibration so when you said that you do that, I was like, oh, I got to share with her the, the heat, home, and yummy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no, that's like amazing. That, right? It's very that's simple. Great. Yeah. And then people just, they, you know, they just find it. They're like, oh yeah, I do feel myself vibrating or yeah, I do feel the vibration. There's a huge science that actually goes back millennia about the healing earth and then how we're grounded to the earth. It's great to go outside and just be in your, um, just your bare feet if you can and then just really uh -huh. feel the energy vibrations of the earth that's why I like to be outside yes also, depending a lot of times people say I can't meditate right mm -hmm. if you have a lot of trauma 
yeah. you're going to have a hard time meditating, right? Right. If you have physical issues or things like that, I think that the breathing and the stillness is also difficult and challenging in our culture only because we're so fast paced. Right? Yes. There's a whole lot of time to sit and be quiet like did happen hundreds of years ago, right? We would get our work done yeah. and then we would sit. We would be in the darkness at night and be with our families or whatever. And then we wouldn't yeah. work until there was sunlight. Now with constant light around the clock, there's not a lot of time to really be at peace. So here's another easy, making it applicable to everybody. Mm-hmm. The best way to meditate I've found, and I've learned this from my, I did neurofeedback a couple of years back. Yeah. And that's what I really found your point about the breathing. You take mm-hmm. neurofeedback and they show you on a graph how you're breathing yes. and how that affects the different parts of the brain. You're going to start to d- breathe a little more deeply. And if yes. you have trouble with it, I highly recommend scuba diving because that'll really get you <laughs> to breathing. control your breathing, right? But she yes. said, my uh, my therapist, um, who was in Asheville, North Carolina at the um, Institute of Applied Neuroscience under really her um, famous doctor is that I can't think of his name right now. But anyway, she, it was his daughter that he, so she, Jordan is her name. And she's like, look, Michelle. She goes, the best way for you to really get still and meditate as a practice is to be focused when you're driving. Mm -hmm. And I didn't tell her that I had, I had trouble being focused when it was like, I had to change my music. Yeah. Uh, You know, I had to put my phone in the trunk because I was constantly, you know, dangerous with it. Cause I, I'm that I have a busy brain because of the complex PTSD. And I know people are out there because you can also get a busy brain from just being on social media too much. Um, You can develop because whatever wires, whatever fires in your brain wires. So it is important that when you're driving to just drive, put that phone, turn it off, put it in the trunk and just focus on driving. Cause that's a great way. If you can't do what Stacy's doing every morning, which a lot of people can't, Stacy, to sit and no, be, you know, no matter how pretty we make our our rooms, right? <laughs> it's it's tough for some people. Um, yeah, you know, maybe you can just get a forest walk, you know, or maybe all you can do is just be focused while you're driving and focus on your breathing while right. you're driving, you know, just so that you're deeply focused on the here and now as you look at traffic and the sounds around you, could you imagine how many less accidents we would have if people just paid attention while they were driving? My goodness. Right. Oh my gosh. Yes. You know, most, you know, so many car accidents each year are caused because people are on their cells or they're looking on their cells. They hear a beep, their message came in. They have to see who it is. You know, they, people have a hard time. They've got an addicted to, you know, to all these devices that we now have available to us and people have a very hard time just putting down that phone, you know, I'm gonna add I, that to the health routine. That's going to yeah. be part of our health routine that we're teaching people. So we yeah. have, right. The Stacy health routine, the Michelle health routine. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Okay. This, this, the, the focus the while focus. you're driving. Yes. And, uh, you know, cause people, we, you know, even our younger, uh, we are, you know, our next millennium of, of kids, the next generation, they don't even know how to communicate well. You know, the communication skills have declined tremendously because they're constantly on their phones. They're constantly addicted to their d- d- their d- devices. And it's not healthy. You know, it really, the people who grew up in the times where we didn't have the cell phones, we didn't, I didn't have a cell phone until my thirties, you know, and I, I, it actually was a good thing because you had to pick up the phone or go outside. If you needed to do a, a report, you had to go to the library, you know, it was, it was a different generation. And I, th- I think the computers came when I was in college, you know, that was when, when we actually got the, our first taste of Google and the internet, you know, and it, it was, but it was a good thing because you interacted with people. You had to talk to people, you know, you were studying. When I studied in college, there were groups of people who all got together and it was like group study sessions. People were interacting, communicating and helping each other. And it was like a different era. And the trust factor, I think was a little higher too. Like people had more trust in each other, even though things still went on, 
you know, it, but people had a different attitude toward other individuals. And, you know, we see a lot of different things happening as we get older. And I don't know if it's because of the internet, it's because of the false information, it's because of the conspiracies and all these things people are tuning into and believe in our society is changing. And I think it's so important to appreciate nature, like you were saying, and get out there and really feel the beauty of what the world is, because the world is a miracle. Think about it you know we have the trees give us oxygen you know that we weren't put together because a bunch of rocks came together and formed planet earth you know everything that we have on earth is here for a purpose you know there's reasons we have the grass there's reasons why we have trees there's reasons why we have certain plants everything you know the one thing i could say is perfect is the creation of the, the universe itself because everything is here for a reason so why not utilize that nature utilize that beauty and really appreciate it because you never know what the next day may bring and i tell people this all the time because we expect to be here our longevity, you know, we expect to be here tomorrow and the next day and the next day, or we'll make it to our seventies and eighties, but we don't know what the next day may bring. We don't. So we, so we should live life like every day is our last life and enjoy it, appreciate it, have gratitude and have gratitude for the people around us. Cause I think we lack that also because, you know, one of the things, you know, we tend to do is we take the people we love for granted or our friends for granted, cause we know they'll be there for us, but we should really take time to maybe appreciate them give them throw out some compliments and even to strangers, you know, stop and give a person a compliment, you know, because, you know, a compliment can change someone's whole attitude, you know, appreciating somebody for who they are. And, you know, it's, it's a different way of, of, of living and it's a healthier way. And it can also change you as a person and the way you view life and even that your happiness level and how you feel about yourself can increase and make you a better person. Okay. Watch, watch this for a second. So may I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. What is the good about the internet though? Because you and I both make the, our livings with, you know, social media and the internet and so yeah. forth. So I look at like, you know, cause I'm always looking at things from a human development context. Yeah. And I think about what's really wonderful about the internet is the ability to self-express Yes. And if we look at how things are making us feel again, you know, I believe that, you know, especially our younger generations are more in tune with their feelings and they can express that more than you and I could have. At, right. at, like when the, inter the computers were introduced, but then yeah. the question really becomes is what gives you joy? And then how can we craft our lives or craft our conversations and craft um, an existence because we all will yeah. die one day around what gives us joy so yeah. what gives you joy Stacey what gives me joy yeah. um so my passion to help people really gives me joy you know yeah, I, I can I, see that I, you know the, from the moment I you know I, I I'll tell you real quickly when I was five I had an ear infection and I had a um a little virus and uh and one day my mom heard some noise in my room so she came in my room it was late at night I was and she opened the door and I was turning blue and I was in a grand mal seizure. So they rushed me to the hospital and they found that the virus that traveled to my brain and caused encephalitis mm. um, it induced me into a coma. And they said, most likely she'll be paraplegic or she'll have severe brain damage if she comes mm. out. So my father being from Greece, he was praying by my bedside. And he said that he used to, there used to be like one island um, that he lived on. They had one church. And he was praying to a statue that he ha was in front of the church and teardrops used to roll down it. And he prayed and he looked up and a teardrop rolled from my eye. And I opened mm. my eyes up and I asked for McDonald's French fries. And uh, no kidding. Looked, yeah. And I wasn't paraplegic and I didn't have severe brain damage, but I did have epilepsy. And, you know, life was like a roller coaster ride, especially when I got to college. Um, it was really challenging because the late night studying, the pressures of college, my seizures increased tremendously. And I didn't think I was going to be able to complete college. And it was on my bucket list. So it was really hard for me. So I one day wrote a letter and I asked the Epilepsy Foundation had a magazine. I asked them to publish it. And I asked, how do you cope with epilepsy? How do you live life having this disorder? Three to 400 letters came to my home from people all over the United States and Canada. 
and they shared their stories with me and they talked about how they cope with epilepsy. And I found it so inspiring. For the first time in my life, I felt like I wasn't alone because when I went to the library, there was like four or five books on epilepsy. They're written by doctors in medical terminology, went right over your head if you weren't a doctor. And that, I gotta say, pissed me off. And when I got these letters, I realized that there are hundreds of people out there just like me with the same emotions, the same feelings, the same thoughts. And I use that as a motivation and, it, and I use their tips and their suggestions to get me through college. Then I got into the big corporate world. I started working, you know, and I had an excellent job. I was doing really well. And uh, one day I just felt the seizure coming on and uh, I had, I had tried to look for like an area where I wasn't going to have a seizure, you know, where nobody would see me have the seizure. And I fell to the ground and I was conscious, but I was, I was in the seizure. And one mm -hmm. of the corporate executives just stepped over me and kept walking and they, what? I could see step over me and they just kept walking they didn't stop and a half an hour later the associate came over to me and they said Stacy you're doing really great but just don't meet the quota and I knew it was because I had the seizure that they didn't want me there they just didn't want the liability or whatever the fact you know um so I just walked out of there with my head up high I said you know what I'm not going to let this get to me so then I started my own freelance business I started to write and I I happened to meet an herbalist and and he needed a lot of research and writing done on 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 uh, natural healing and holistic living. So I started to um, I started to do all that research. I said, "Wow, a lot of these things could pertain to me. And that could help me." And I started practicing all these different ways. I started doing detox. I changed my lifestyle. I changed my sleeping habits. I incorporated vitamins. And before I knew it, my seizures went from 12, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3 to the point where I was controlled. So it was a combination of medication, changing my lifestyle, holistic living, detox, and all these things combined, I was actually able to control my seizures. And then I, I used all those letters and I created that regiment that I created for myself and put it in that book I was telling you about earlier. And that book actually became a bestseller because back then there were no books on epilepsy. Right, no. And I just, I happened to just rewrite that book during COVID because life had changed so much in the past 25 years. I rewrote the book and it actually hit a bestsellers on the bestsellers list again. And I, you know, from when I got that letter, I was telling you about that email. That was when I realized what my true calling was. It wasn't to work in the city with big corporate executives and one day to be in front of the camera and to do all these things that I envisioned myself doing. You know, my true calling was to help people. And I realized that after all this stuff happened and that was my purpose. That was my passion. That was when the light bulb went off and I just totally took a different journey in life. And from that moment on, I just, I, I focused on helping others. And I realized that what I went through could help more than just people with epilepsy. It could help people going through anything in life from post-traumatic stress disorder to diabetes, to anything, you know, you know, anything in life. And so that's what my, you know, why I, I turned and I used all these things. I used the internet as a power source. You know, I, I, you know, I told my story and I came out and out of the woodwork and starting to share my story. Cause I didn't share my story till later on because I was told to hush about it also. And I started talking about it. I started, you know, people from TV started contacting me and asked me to, to talk about my story and to come on. And, and I started helping people and that's where I just grew and grew and grew and grew. But it was, it was, you know, the internet, the internet was a power source because I was able to reach out to hundreds of millions of people and right. maybe, people, you know, so in, in a sense, it is a great thing because you could use the internet as, as a positive note, you know, um, as long as you don't abuse it, you know, it, it you know, if you use it in it's a with positive everything, way, don't you think like exactly. with everything, like, you know, I mean, we talk about like the big tech companies and what they've done right or wrong. You know, at the end of the day, it's a communication tool. It's an, at the end of the day, it's no different when I'm at home at night, my husband comes, you know, we're having dinner and then we both check out and yes. do our, uh, on our, we have to get conscious and say, you know what, honey, let's put the phones up and let's look at each other, be with yeah. each other kiss each other and actually enjoy each other's company yes. love language is being together. So, you know, but, um, but like with anything we can check out, right. People check out with alcohol or with TV or with overspending or shopping, uh, eating. Right. So the numbing of humanity comes in all forms. 
And so I think that that's really, you know, when I'm writing about mental injury is not mental illness, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and whether you have an illness or an injury, it doesn't matter. You still have to self-soothe and you have to self-care. And that's what we need more of. And that's what your story is really about is you learned yourself how to how other people took care of themselves with epilepsy. Then you started to teach other people and then it, and then the ripple effect goes on. That's what, that's what's so beautiful, right. About being a human, because we do have the gift of language and we can teach others. And that's what's so satisfying um, as our purpose grows, you know, and then however it calls to you, whether, you know, you're experiencing, a higher power or the call of your um, angels, or you just love your dog a whole lot and you know what an emotional right. love looks like, you yes. know? Mm-hmm. So I really, yeah, I'd like to write about your um, healthy rituals, that your routine that you've discovered for yourself. And so I hope that's okay with you if I write about that. And Oh, I would I'm love you to. Too. Definitely, okay, yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's in the book that you're talking about is um, the one behind you, Epilepsy, that book, or is it the impact? Which book is it that you, when I did one during COVID, I rewrote Epilepsy, You're Not Alone. Right. And okay. I created Empower Yourself. Don't let your conditions empower you. And I wrote that during COVID also. And I, in that book, I talk about the steps that I went through. So I talked about the denial. I talked about the um, learn how to accept yourself for who you are loving yourself for who you are, working on your your courage and your self-esteem, and then also learn how to create a lifestyle that would be helpful to you. So that basically is, you know, starting to set short-term goals and long-term goals and to realize that we do live in a society where people want quick results all the time. But, you know, when you're working on yourself and you're healing yourself, it's a slow process and it can be a very painful process. It usually is. But at the end, once you get to the other side, at the end of the rainbow it's a beautiful feeling and you feel you feel a a million times better once you get all that hurt out of you you feel so strong inside and you feel Mm -hmm. like you dominate the world you know because you feel so good about yourself and you know I talk about that and I talk about self-love and self-care and how it's so important because so many people you know they feel guilty about taking time out for themselves because they either they have children or they have a family to take care of, or they have, they're a caretaker and they feel like they always have to help others or do, do, do. And they're never focusing on the the person that's most important is themselves. And it's okay because I always say, how could you help others if you can't help yourself? Right. You know, yourself should be your first priority. And then you, you're able to have that strength to help others. And these are some of the steps I talk about in the book. And then I talk about in self-empowerment and how do we release the power within us? Because we all carry that power. It's just learn how to release it. And I talk about meditation and I talk about yoga and I talk about different things that you could incorporate into your life that could make a big difference in your life and the way you feel and the way you look at things and, you know, and how health is important and so forth. I really want to acknowledge you because, you know, my um, annual theme, I always, I don't do resolutions. I do annual themes. I've been doing Mm -hmm. this since 1996. And my theme this year was um, connection. Mm -hmm. And your story in particular is so beautiful about why connection matters, right? And how connection can really heal. Because there you were, you know, a child with a new condition and not really understanding like how to help yourself. Right then other people shared their story to help you. And now you're helping others. And that's just a really beautiful, I can really, I can, you know, when you create a resolution or a goal or a theme, whatever it is, you're never quite sure how it's going to turn out or like what's going to come. So I never dreamed that I'd be having this conversation with you and see it so clearly about why our stories matter for each other. Right. Yeah. And why holding our tongue and not sharing can be just as detrimental, um, not only to you, but to the other person, because it's in it's in the sharing that yes. we, we gather strength with each other and, and then we flourish together. So thank you so much, Stacey. Oh, and thank you. You know, you have very similar, we have different stories, but you know, it's, we really walk very similar paths, you know, because you went through trauma in your own life. 
and you were able to overcome it. And a lot of people, you know, when they've gone through, you know, what you've gone through, they're not able to overcome it. They don't know how. And, you know, and like you said, it's so important to talk about it and share. And I found even group therapy to be a very powerful tool too. Sure. You know, it it was very, you know, when I did group therapy, it was very painful, but yet it was very um, helpful at the same time. They taught me tools and techniques and strategies, you know, just by listening to others and then by sharing the pain and releasing the pain, you know, I was able to overcome so many things in life and I learned how to cope with things and people don't realize it, but over 70% of illnesses are caused by stress. So we really, you know, life is stressful. We endure stress every single day. So, you know, we're always affected by stress, but the, the really important factor too is learning how to cope with our stress and communication is one of the ways to cope with our stress. And it's important that people learn how to communicate and to improve their communication skills okay. because a lot of people don't know how to communicate or we were taught in the environment we grew up, you know, that we can only say certain things, but other things you know, you have to keep to yourselves. And if you remember growing up, they said boys can't cry, you know, you know, boys have to be a man, they have to act like a man, you know, so, you know, a lot of men repress their emotions. And a lot of women were told to be, sh sh you know, labelize it and the stigmatisms. So, you know, it's communication is key. It really is. The one place, you know, I did do nonviolent communication studies, which I found very helpful, but I did also take a lot of courses at a place called Landmark and mm -hmm. Landmark, um, you know, taught me leadership, self-expression, taught me how to really create projects inside, um, something that I'm creating for my future. So if I really highly recommend that, um, yeah. you've also had me think about, um, group therapy in my life. You know, it's, I don't think it's done anymore today, but when I was 17, um, I was getting therapy in Louisville. Mm -hmm. um, for what had happened to me as a child. And they yeah. put me in group therapy with, um, with families, um, and the pedophiles themselves. Wow. That was hardcore. And so we oh, had, yeah. we had rooms where it was just the victims. And then there were other rooms. It was like one big church. Right. And so there were other rooms that were the, um, the abusers. Wow. And so they each had their own therapy with a, they had a facilitator, and then you would graduate to a room with both victims and abusers in the same room. Wow. And I was very young. You know, it was like 17, 18, 19. And I remember uh, it was in Louisville. And I don't, I've, I've looked to see if that program still exists somewhere. I think it was called Parents United. I don't think it exists anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And I remember it being very hardcore because, you know, you're, you're a young victim and yeah. then you're sitting next to somebody who is abusing or has abused children, it's really intense. Oh my gosh. I will say this though. I will say this. Just like, you know, other types of group therapy experiences, you start to see everyone as humans, right? That's That was the beauty of that is that you would have, um, you know, somebody who experienced it as a child themselves and then they grew up to be an abuser. Yeah. And you could see that it was a cycle and that they were human. And um, I have to say that that, you know, while, you know, I did stand for my abuser to go to jail and serve his sentence. At the same time, I had compassion for, you know, why people do the things that they do. Um, yes. Doesn't mean that we don't hold people to account and we don't hold them responsible Right? Exactly. Like yes. we are, you know, uh, there's a lot in our DNA that we can't control, but there's a lot in our choice and our day to day um, structures that yes. we can choose to take care of ourselves and not hurt other people, help instead of hurt. So it's really been great. Yeah. Just, you know, it's been sort of a, a little bit of a, I'll have to journal about all that we've talked about too, because I'm like, I'm having lots of memories about things. Yeah. I find that for myself, like one of my self-care things is when I start to have flashbacks or memories, like journaling and writing really helps for me. So thanks. Oh, thank for you. me too. Yeah. Yes. You know, I, 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 you know, one thing that you, you brought up and that came to me when you were talking was forgiveness and, yes. you know, that's, you know, I came from a dysfunctional family and I had a lot of scars. And when I 
grew you know, the, over 70% of the United States has it comes from dysf sure. dysfunction. Of and, course. And you know. the problem is that we, a lot of people tend to, tend to repeat the behaviors that they're taught because they're in an right. environment and it's considered normal to them. So they continue it, you right. know, and I was able to break away from that cycle, but during that cycle later on, especially in the group therapy, you know, just like you had in your church, I was able to learn how to forgive. So forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to hear the person say, I'm sorry. You as a person has to learn to say, okay, you know, that, you know, this situation was wrong. I, you know, this person was not at right mind. You know, um, they have their, their issues, whatever it is, and they have their mental in injuries. And you have to say, you know, I forgive what they did. You know, it's not right what they did to us, but I forg I forgive, you know, because I find when I didn't forgive and I held that anger and I held that frustration in me, it was more painful. And when I let finally let go of things that were done, you know, growing up to me, I was, it, it was like a sense of relief. It was like a, a brick was taken off my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And so you don't necessarily have to hear, hear the person say, I'm sorry. It's you coming to a point in your life where you could forgive them for what they did and just learn to let go and move forward and realize, and like I said, the past is the past. We can't change the past. We can't change what happened. We could just focus, we could just focus on the present and work on, on making a, a great future for ourselves. Mm. I love, you know, and let me share, I, I had a client, Dr. Matthew James, who was from Hawaii and he um, had been handed the lineage of Huna and there's a practice called Honopono Ono that mm -hmm. um, Hawaiians taught the United Nations. And I'm going to teach it to you right now. Um, so forgiveness. So there's a practice in Hawaii. And by the way, they didn't have mental illness in their culture until white men came into Hawaii. And part oh, really? because of some of their traditions like this, they didn't even have a word for it, right? They even yeah. helped the warriors after wartime. They had like this whole process that's inside um, the Huna traditions in Honopono Ono. So Honopono Ono um, is basically saying, I forgive you, please forgive me. Right. A lot of people will say, Oh, I forgive you, Stacey. Yeah. But they forget the little piece of please forgive me. It's reciprocal. Right. right. Yes. You've done me wrong. I've done you wrong. It's like it's a piece together. Right. Yes. Now, um, to help that process, because you might not always get that reciprocation. One of the practices they have that I was taught is that you go to bed at night and I like to sit actually up in my bed and I like to pretend that I have like this little um, puppet theater on my lap and it's like yeah. my life of a little puppet theater right and uh -huh. so everybody that I've met through the day is on my stage and then I visually and sometimes I use it with my if I had especially bad day I know this sounds really cheesy but just try it it really really works okay just cut any type of cord that you have with anybody that you've met that day good or bad right I like that. that lady yeah. in the grocery store that person at church that person at the bookstore, that lady on the podcast, we just cut our energetic line together and it's complete for that day. Then we go to sleep. When we come wake up in the morning, it's a fresh, clean slate. I like that. Right? Yeah. And I like they, that. Do, they do that. Uh, they teach that in Hawaii. And um, energetically, it's really, it, it allows you to be really free because you're not always going to get that completion from that other person. You yeah. know, sometimes people are just, it's their own reflection and their own unhappiness where they yes. have to hold that grudge, but that yes. doesn't have to hold you back. Right? right. So whether we're talking about people's injuries, illnesses, challenges, obstacles, it's the life experience. You know, yeah. we are all human. We do not get out of this experience. In, mm -hmm. in these body bags without yeah. some type of challenge, you know? Um, so yeah, so I don't know if you knew about that ritual, but there you go, Honoponono. No, I never heard of it. I like it though. Okay, I, good. I like it's great. I think it's great. I actually, I'm going to start doing that because there's plenty of times that I have gone to bed and things have, have happened during the day that I was still upset about. 
and you go to bed and it's hard to go to sleep because those emotions are kind of like stirring like a volcano. And it's just, you know, it's, but if you kind of let go before you go to bed and you just cut it away and you think of that fresh slate in your head, just like a white chalkboard yes. with nothing written, that kind of brings a more um, common, a soothing feeling inside you. And it's really all about how we mentally visualize things. Exactly, because the brain is visual. Yeah, that's yes. right. So yeah, that's I why do... it's important to use, you know, pantomime or a collage. Yeah. You could even cut a real piece of magazine paper, whatever right. works for people. But your brain works in images. That's why yeah. it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. That's it. That's amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. You know. This has been great. I, I think, you know, this session has been wonderful. You put out so many important factors and you gave such great solutions. You know, you've made, a, you talked about a lot of different issues. Ditto, you know, Stacey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think both of us actually gave a lot of great input, you know, because with every problem, there is a solution. It's just trying to find the solution. And if you realize in life, no matter what we go through in life, we always make it through, you know, at the moment, it's very difficult. And we go through, we go through our emotions, but, you know, we, if you think about it, anything that happened in your life, you got through it eventually, you know, and that's when, when trauma hits, we have to realize that, that we will get through it. You know, we always do. And it's just, you know, using the right techniques, using the right tools and helping yourself get through it. So it doesn't have to make you stuck, make you feel like you can't move on and make you not progress in your life because everyone deserves a life where they can reach their potential in life. And, you know, nothing should get in the way of it. And I think the, the tools that you mentioned today and the steps that you mentioned, the techniques can help someone so they can reach their true potential in life and actually gain that level of happiness that they deserve. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so you, much. Stacey. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'd love for you know people to connect with me. You can go to the, um, if you just go to write the trauma.org, W R I T E the trauma.org, you'll find me at psychology today. That's awesome. And do you have a website or anything that for people to go on? Yeah. Uh, if you go to write the trauma.org, um, it'll be my, uh, that bio has like all the links that you would need for me professionally and personally, whether you want to work out with me online, do PR, or just share your story with me. Cause you know, I'm always, um, like you, um, you know, I've had just tons of ideas now, like, you know, how else could we actually enlarge the story, um, base of people surviving mental injuries? Yeah. Because you know, it's not really a term that's really widely known. And it's one that I'm really committed to um, educating people about. So we release the stigma of both mental illness and mental injury so that people have space to really say, you know, yes. what's your story? Why are you acting this way? And, and what do you need? And how can I help you? And I love that because this is the first time that I've heard the term oh, mental really? injury. And I love it because in my whole life, I fought for, um, you know, uh, for people having for the, cause our life is full of stigmas. You know, we are, you know, we, we, everybody labelizes everybody. And there's before you, before you even, you know, before you even know that person, just by that labelization and that stigma, people already decided who you are, right. how good you are. Nope. And yeah. yeah. And it's so important, you know, because well, I'm you walking say, over you as the corporate guy walking over your body. Yeah. That's what we're doing to people. Disgusting. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we, we can't judge others. I always say, you know, you can't, you, you can't judge others by the picture. Yeah. You have to really, you know, I always say you, you have to really feel their heart and really get to know a person. And it's not by, you know, what they have or how they look or, you know, it's about who they are as a person and everybody has beauty within. So I, I think it's great. I love, I love the idea of, of, you know, using the word mental injury, because when you say mental injury, you think of healing. If it's an injury, there is healing involved yeah. and he, you know, uh, can, you know, can, you can heal its move and move on. So I, Stacey, I love what that. 
before I leave you though, what should that guy have done for you before, instead of walking over you, if you see somebody with going through a seizure, what should you do? If you see someone having a seizure, it's a very scary, um, uh, thing to see someone have a seizure. There's many different types. Some, there's times there's stop and stare seizures where you're just looking at the person, their eyes get glassy and they could just keep glazing at you and you're talking to them, but they're not responding. Or you could have seizures where people just swing to one side or swing to the other side, or you could have grandma seizures where the whole body starts to shake. And then there are times where people, you know, during the seizures, people start to, you know, they don't breathe, you know, things could happen. But the, the one thing you have to do is stop Make sure the person is in a comfortable position where they can't get hurt. So if you have a jacket, if they have a jacket or something soft, put them in an area where they're not going to bang their head. Or even if you lay their head, you know, by your their their your lap where they can, you know, if they tend to shake their head or move their head, they're not going to get hurt. Just you know, make sure they're in a safe spot. Usually seizures don't last too long, and you know, seizures could last a couple of seconds. They could last you know 15 seconds, and if a seizure continues where it's not, they're not coming out, then you, you can get you know help. And you call 911. But most of the time, people have short seizures and they come out of it and they feel fine afterwards. They may get a little, be a little confused. They may experience memory loss. They may be a little tired, but usually, you know, people, um, you know, come out of it and, and they're fine. Uh, but, but just, just make, make sure the body is safe. Like just, just the body you know, is. And that's gosh, it. if we could just like, you know, if we could have a, a, tr a real trauma informed world where we would all really just stop and say, what do you need? And then make sure that you're safe like that, instead of walking over you, just that, that excites me to build that world. And I think, you know, that's the biggest problem is the lack of information. People don't understand and they fear what they don't know. And if we could get out there and instead of the doctors always putting information about the, you know, the, the, the treat, the, what it is, the treatment, the causes, the symptoms, let's talk about what it is, how to cope with it, and you know how to how to be able to move forward and help you know help these people because I think if people understood what these you know these these mental in injuries are or if people understood different conditions better people would not you know react the way they do it's the lack of information you know um, that's out there it's really we need more information about what it is and how to cope with it and it's okay everybody has something if you go in a room everybody has a story. Everybody has something, you know, and it's being able to accept everybody for who they are, no stigmatisms, no labelizing, and being able to understand, you know, where they're coming from and not, not automatically labelizing that person and, you know, and just treating that person as an individual and a human being, because that's what they are. They deserve respect. And that's the key. Every person on this planet deserves respect. That's beautiful, Stacey. Thank you so much for this opportunity today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a wonderful experience. I'm so glad that you came on the show. And my heart is out to you too. I, you know, I, I've known you for a while, you know, through emails. This is the first time we actually got to, you know, speak with one another. And I'm so glad we did because you are a beautiful person and, you Thank know, you. Uh, you have so much to offer this, this, this world. And I, I, you know, I hope that you have continued success and I, you know, anytime you want to come back on the show, I'd love to have you on the show. And we could talk more about these, these issues and how to help people. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. You have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.